Check out some basic movement in Unity. When I press the left and right arrows on my keyboard, the avatar runs to the left and right. When I press the up and down arrows on my keyboard, the avatar runs forward and back. The code that makes this type of movement possible is pretty trivial. You've probably seen it or written it more than a dozen times. But writing integration and unit tests for this kind of logic isn't as cut and dry. Here are some integration tests that I've written for the movement logic in the demo. The code under test is located within the update method of a mono behavior called player. Each test has the unity test attribute so that player's update method is invoked when they run. The first test asserts that horizontal input causes the player object to move along the x-axis. And the second test asserts that vertical input causes the player object to move along the z-axis. They both fail, of course, because there's no user input when they run. Test suites are supposed to be automated. Being required to click the keyboard for every test would sort of defeat the purpose. So how do we make these tests pass? To find the answer, we'll need to examine the code under test. Again, the movement logic can be found within the player class's update method. First, it reads the current input value of each access using Unity's input API. Then, it multiplies those values by speed and delta time. Using the result of that calculation, it then creates a movement vector, which it adds to the player object's current position. The problem we're facing lies with Unity's static input class. Static classes are the bane of automated tests because there's no way to control their output. You probably noticed that input isn't our only problem. Delta time comes from Unity's time API, which is also exposed via a static class called time. We're going to need to deal with these static classes if we ever want our tests to pass. The humble object pattern is used when your code contains components that are hard to test. These are typically framework classes or asynchronous logic. In our case, we've got Unity's input and time classes. They're both framework classes that are hard to test because they're both static. You implement the humble object pattern by isolating testable code from the hard to test parts, extracting it into its own object that can be tested independently. Doing this often leaves the original object so simple that it no longer needs to be tested. It becomes nothing more than a humble wrapper, which is where the pattern gets its name. Let's extract the testable code from the player class and turn player into a humble object. The first thing we need to do is identify the testable portion of update. If you ask me, this entire section looks pretty easy to test, minus the call to time.delta time, of course. But we can fix that by stuffing delta time into a temporary variable. Now, we can move this entire chunk of code into its own method. Let's copy and paste it into a new method called CalculateMovement. This method is going to replace the inline movement calculation, so we'll make it return a vector. It'll return the movement variable, which we can actually just get rid of at this point and we'll add three arguments for the values returned by Unity's input and time APIs. Horizontal input, vertical input, and delta time. Great, now that the errors are gone, let's introduce it into update and remove the old code. All right, so what we have here is the poor man's humble object. It's a variation of the humble object pattern, where the logic is extracted into a testable method. At this point, I could update the player test to call calculate movement instead of update. But I want to do a full implementation of the humble object pattern. So we're going to extract this into its own class called movement. We'll do this by simply copy and pasting the entire method into the empty body of the new class. And let's rename it to calculate, since it now exists in the context of the movement class. Of course, we'll need a property for speed as well, which we can expose on the constructor. With all the errors gone, we can now add a movement property to the player class. And replace the call to calculate movement in update with movement.calculate.
Last but not least, we can remove Calculate Movement from Player. And I'm going to clean up this update method by inlining the variables. This is a complete implementation of the humble object pattern. Now we can really visualize where it gets its name. The player class has slimmed down tremendously. The meat of its logic, the logic that we really want to test, now lives in the movement class. Speaking of testing, we can now begin writing some tests that will actually pass. Let's make a class called Movement Tests. We're going to recreate the tests for player, but this time they'll use the nUnit test attribute. Again, the first one tests left and right movement for horizontal input. The first test will assert that movement.calculate returns a vector with an x value of 1 when it receives a horizontal input value of 1. To ensure that values are uniform, let's instantiate movement with 1 speed and pass in a delta time of 1. The second test will assert that movement.calculate returns a vector with a z value of 1 when it receives a vertical input value of 1. Again, we'll instantiate movement with one speed and pass in one for the delta time. All right, let's run these tests. And it should come as no surprise that they all pass with flying colors. At this point, we could write some more tests to make our suite more robust. But let's take another look at our humble object, the player class. As a humble object, player has become very lean. But there's still some logic in here that I'd like to have tests for. I'd like to assert that the player object's movement is indeed being affected by user input. But we still have Unity's static input and time classes to contend with. How do we take control of them? How can we override the values that they return so we can have consistent and predictable tests? The answer lies with dependency injection. Dependency injection is a technique whereby one object supplies the dependencies of another object. Right now, the player class has a dependency on user input and delta time. It supplies itself those dependencies by accessing Unity static API classes. We're going to change that by wrapping those static classes into a service class, and then making player depend on that instead. Then we'll inject the service right into player at runtime. We'll be able to give the player object any version of that service we'd like, including a fake one that's created specifically for our tests. First, we need to create an interface for our service. Let's call it iUnity Service. For now, iUnity service is just going to expose the method and the property that player uses. That would be delta time, which is a float value, and the get access raw method that accepts a string argument and returns a float. Next, we'll create a concrete class that inherits iUnity service called Unity service. It'll implement iUnity service and delegate delta time to time.delta and get access raw to input.get access raw. Now that our service is complete, we can introduce a new dependency to the player class. Player will now have an iUnity service property. We'll use that property to replace all the calls to Unity static API classes. First, the two calls to get access raw, and then the single call to delta time. Now, at this point, we could come up with all sorts of fancy ways to inject Unity service. We could write a preloader class, or build our own IOC container, or even use a well-known dependency injection framework like Zenject. All of these would work just fine. But for now, I'm just going to lazy load a copy on start. In the start method, I'm going to check to see if Unity service is null. If it is, then I'll just instantiate a copy of Unity service, and that's it. With this complete, we can actually write some tests that'll pass. With that groundwork laid behind us, getting our tests to pass is incredibly simple. All we have to do is create a mock version of iUnity service. Then we simply tell it to return 1 when get access raw is past the string horizontal.
and 1 for the delta time property. Then we just inject it into player. Easy as that. I'll repeat the process for the second test. And now we can rerun the tests. Great, they pass. Now our code is entirely supported by a small suite of passing tests. And in case we were feeling skeptical, we can switch on over to Unity and rerun the demo. First, left and right movement. Seems to be okay. And now, forward and backwards movement. Works as well. Writing automated tests is an important skill that all developers should know. If you're interested in learning more, check out my video, How to Unit Test Unity Code. And as always, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please feel free to like, comment, and subscribe. And be sure to turn on notifications as well, as I'll be releasing a new video every Friday, and you won't want to miss it.